ice, one of nature's most formidable barriers. In the channels and shipping routes of the world, it can bring transportation to a dead stop. This is the adversary of the icebreaker. Specially designed ships with reinforced hulls and massive power to shatter winter's frozen domain. Wherever ice gets in the way of maritime commerce or scientific research, ice-breaking ships are called on to open the way. They do this by grooming channels, creating lanes through which ships follow. Other times, they get up close and personal by winching the bow of a beset vessel into a specially designed padded notch and using the power of both ships to force through the frozen hard pack. It is late January on the Great Lakes. A smooth, undisturbed layer of white covers the entire landscape. At this time of year, it is difficult to tell where the shore ends and the water begins. On Lake Huron, the ice is usually only two feet thick. But the wind can cause the ice to pile up on itself, forming a pressure ridge many times thicker. Shipped goods are imperative for the Great Lakes communities. And ships carrying these goods must make their way through this ice. Detroit alone needs 65,000 tons of fuel oil every day, much of which will be transported by barge. The 290-foot U.S. Coast Guard cutter, Mackinac, has been charged with keeping these supply lines open. With her reinforced hull, spoon-shaped bow, and mighty 10,000 horsepower diesel electric engines. The Mackinac has been designed for one purpose, ice breaking. The U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Mackinac is a unique, one-of-a-kind icebreaker. It was built in 1944 during the war, and it was built in a response to essentially help move the iron ore that was needed to do the ship construction for the war effort. As the oldest icebreaker on the Great Lakes, her tenure has made her one of the most famous ships in these waters. In nearly 60 years of service, the Mackinac has seen many renovations. On the bridge, ornate 1940s original equipment shares space with modern radar and navigation instruments. But what makes her truly remarkable as an icebreaker is her combination of strength and power. Well, the Mackinac, like all icebreakers, have special features that allow them to uh, take on the, the, the massive forces of the ice. One is the hull form, which uh, most of the ships now have a kind of a spoon bow, and they look sort of like a football cut in half if you were to pull them out of the water. The unique hull shape allows the ship to ride up on top of an ice sheet, using the weight of the vessel to break through. Along with that hull form, they also need very thick hull plating where it meets the ice, and they also need a lot of structure behind the plating to reinforce against the ice. An intricate array of steel girders form the ribs of the Mackinac. Placed 16 inches apart, they support and reinforce the two-inch steel hull plating, which is nearly twice the thickness of normal ships. The additional strength comes with a price. The Mackinac displaces over 5,000 tons fully loaded. Moving a ship this size through the ice requires an enormous amount of power. On board Mackinac, there are three main edge rooms. This is one of them. It is the heart and soul of the vessel. We have six main diesel engines, Fairbanks Morse post piston, and they are coupled to a generator. The generators provide electricity for both of the 5,000 horsepower propulsion motors, which in turn spin the two 10.7 ton aft propellers. 
The diesel electric engine has been used on board icebreakers for quite a while and it's the preferred uh, power plant primarily because when the propeller goes through the ice if it hits a large piece there's a shock on that propeller and it's transmitted back through the shaft. The propeller shafts are spun by the powerful electric motors which utilize magnetic fields for propulsion as opposed to being directly attached to the diesel power plant which would require additional gears and mechanical linkages. More to damage if a propeller were suddenly jammed in the ice. The Mackinac has other traits that make her at home in the ice. Onboard tanks and pumps comprise a heel and trim system. In 30 seconds, over 100,000 gallons of water can be pumped from one side of the boat to the other. The rapid shift in ballast causes the over 74 foot wide ship to rock, crushing the surrounding ice. An additional propeller at the bow can also be employed. By churning the water ahead of the vessel, the propeller destabilizes the ice while washing the broken pieces from its path. But the years of ice breaking have taken their toll, and the mighty Mackinac is beginning to show her age. Because of her age, it's costing a lot of money to keep the Mackinac operational, and it also takes a lot of people on board to do the maintenance. Uh, plans right now are to replace this ship with a, uh, a new icebreaker that'll be multi-mission in nature. But until the replacement is built, the Mackinac remains on patrol. As long as there is ice in the water, there is plenty of work to be done. Up to 60 merchant ships navigate the frozen waters of the Great Lakes, and the Mackinac cannot protect them all. Ten additional icebreakers share the duty. Two Canadian vessels, three buoy tenders, and five Bay-class icebreaking tugs work as a team to keep all the Great Lakes open to shipping. The U.S. Coast Guard also looks to the skies for help. Because when breaking ice, a straight line is not always the best route. The H-65 Dolphin helicopters lift ice advisors from the ships. Once aloft, they relay course information back to the captains. When you're on the bridge of the cutter, you can only see so far. Being able to climb to 1,000 or 2,000 feet, we can give them a better idea where they should go to hit the open water. That would be a, a much less arduous task than breaking through all the hard stuff. They are our eyes in the sky. If we're working in a lake environment such as this, um, we could be working uh, a mile or two miles away from a great open water lead and not nail it. But today, the air crew has spotted an enormous ice sheet, blocking the route onto the Mackinac Bridge at the northern tip of Lake Huron. The ice-breaking tug Katmai Bay has been called on to clear the potentially dangerous flow. If the ship was traveling through that area and happened to get stuck, it is possible that that sheet could break loose and start carrying the ship with it anywhere it goes. If the ship is stuck, it's at the mercy of nature, and the wind's blowing it, it could blow it onto a shoal or into some other hazard of navigation. The Bay-class tugs are the most technologically sophisticated icebreakers on the Great Lakes. But for this task, brute force and an experienced crew are all that is necessary. Sometimes we find a pressure ridge, a large windrow that we are unable to just break through on the first time. We have to employ a backing and ramming maneuver. And we'll, we'll take the ship and we'll back up in the track that we just established, anywhere from two to three ship lengths. And then we'll come ahead again and we'll use the backing ability of the ship to keep it in as straight as line as possible. Backing up in the ice can pose a problem for normal non-ice breaking ships. If a fragment were to jam the rudder, the ship would turn out of control. Icebreakers like the Katmai Bay have rudders which are braced at both the top and bottom. An underwater protrusion called an ice horn shields the rudder and helps the ship break ice when moving backwards. Windblown ice like that found under the Mackinac Bridge can stack and fold over on itself, creating pressure ridges up to 20 feet thick. The ship will have to back and ram many times to get through this extremely tough ice. 
Fortunately, the Bay-class ships have other weapons at their disposal. Hull lubrication, or bubbler systems, helps clear the ice from around the ships. Air is expelled through holes below the waterline. The bubbles which are generated force their way up through the ice, causing it to weaken. Once the ship has broken through the pack ice, the specially designed bow and powerful prop wash create wave action in the surrounding water. The ripple effect causes the ice to flex and break apart. The Coast Guard needs these technological tricks. By the end of the season, it has spent over 4,600 hours assisting more than 500 trapped ships, any one of which could have become a financial disaster, or worse, a human tragedy. But the icebreakers and their crews keep the waters safe. One of the things that makes this such a great ship is the crew. They're the ones that do all the hard work. Without a doubt, they're, they're, they're a bunch of can-do coasties. For icebreakers, the Great Lakes are a microcosm. The same scenario plays out with hundreds of ships all over the world. Where people in cold climates depend on shipping, icebreakers are there to clear the way. Next, the combination of economics and polar exploration force early shipbuilders and mariners to push the boundaries and risk their lives. The icebreaker has changed the way ships navigate the waterways of the world. Modern icebreakers can smash through 10-foot thick ice sheets without stopping. But for early wooden, wind-powered ships, the best way to deal with ice was not to be in the water. Prior to icebreakers, uh, the countries that had major uh, ice problems would have to just stop all operations in that area. They would have to move their shipping out of the area just because they would be caught and crushed in the ice. Lightly built wind-powered ships were no match for a frozen waterway. That would begin to change with the perfection of the steam engine by James Watt in the late 1700s and the subsequent creation of steam-powered ships. But there were still problems. In the 1830s and 40s, when you begin to have uh, steam-powered vessels, uh, even they were too underpowered to punch their way through ice. Most of these vessels still had sail, and uh, even the combination of both were too underpowered. Captains who blundered into heavy ice had few options. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, the ships could be trapped until a thaw or mercilessly crushed. The crews would toil to free their ships with sledgehammers or anything else they could find to stave off the encroaching freeze. The other things they could do was put an uh, anchor out on the ice and then using the ship's caps and winch themselves forward. So there really wasn't much you could do. And probably the best illustration of this is what happened to Ernest Shackleton in the Antarctic. His ship was trapped, drifted for many miles, and eventually the, the ice crushed it. Still, many mariners remained undaunted, particularly those who stood to make a great deal of money hunting whales and seals near the frozen poles. In the 1870s or 1880s, whaling and sealing became a fairly uh, good business. Therefore, we had to start getting more strengthened ships for this, and they started to put better framing in the ships and strengthen them on the outside of the ship also. The United States' first real foray into icebreaking came with the purchase of the Alaska Territory in 1867. The federal government charged the Revenue Cutter Service, later to become the U.S. Coast Guard, with regular missions to the region. The ships of the Bering Sea Patrol would set sail in the spring from Seattle. Heading north as the ice melted, they would stop in native villages along the way. The captains of those early cutters were the only government representatives in the territory. Part diplomat and part law enforcement, they were both loved and feared by local inhabitants. 
and they had a doctor and a dentist aboard. They would take care of your ills. And also, the captain was usually appointed a federal judge, and he would sit down and hold trials, hang you from the yard arm or whatever, go to the next town. The captains and crews would also be responsible for enforcing some of America's earliest environmental laws. There was a lot of over-harvesting of seals at this point from, from not only the United States, but from other nations, and they would send the cutters up there to, to help regulate this and protect the seals. One of the cutters in particular was the rush that was up there. She went up there for a number of years. And the old saying, get there to avoid the rush, comes from that. People that were going to do anything illegal had to get there before the rush arrived. Other ships would become renowned for their work in the Alaskan waters. Two of the vessels that the Revenue Cutter Service eventually gets, the Bear and the Thetis, were both built as whalers. And of course, whalers are designed to work in light ice because they can capture whales and kill them. Both of these vessels were built with heavy hulls and were reinforced to work in ice. Known as the Coast Guard's old Ironsides, the 198-foot Bear was constructed in Dundee, Scotland. Built in 1874, the ship was sold to the U.S. 10 years later and would see decades of service. With her tightly spaced reinforcing beams made of ironwood and metal bow plating, she was far stronger than most ships in the water. Still, she was not an icebreaker. Like the ships before her, at best, the bear was ice resistant, having neither the power nor strength to plow through ice. The world would have to wait another 25 years for a ship that strong. In 1899, the first true icebreaker was built. The British ship, Ermac, purchased by the Russian government, boasted engines powerful enough to produce 10,000 horsepower. But better engines were only part of the equation. The next major step for these mighty ships was in hull design. Well, the Kickapoo was a unique vessel. She was built in 1921, and she was altered in 1926. What the Coast Guard did was to increase the length of the vessel and cut back the very bottom part of her bow, which is called the forefoot. And this particular design feature allows her to ride up over the ice and use the weight of the vessel to break the ice. This is a, a very important advance in icebreaker technology because it, it is really a, a design feature that allows the vessel not only to push its way through ice, but actually to break ice. The Northland, commissioned in 1927, replaced the bear in the waters off Alaska. Despite having sails for emergency use, the Northland incorporated the latest design features, as well as a new power plant, the recently developed diesel engine. The United States was now producing strong and powerful ice-breaking ships, but their ability and importance would not be immediately recognized. As is often the case, the technology would have to wait for the world to catch up. Next, the outbreak of World War II gives icebreakers a new global purpose. Today, icebreakers from around the world are regular visitors to the frozen poles. The benefits these ships offer to science and commerce are immeasurable, but that has not always been recognized. By the late 1920s, shipbuilders were making icebreakers that combined strength, power, and design features. But they were expensive. The U.S. Coast Guard still ran the Bering Sea patrols with turn-of-the-century ships. There seemed no reason for the newer, more costly vessels. But that would soon change. In the 1930s, several things happened that required the Coast Guard to begin icebreaking. The first major thing that happens is that in the Northeast, people start heating their homes with fuel oil. Before this time, they had been heating it with coal, and coal was, was brought by rail. But heating oil was brought by barges up the rivers. The shift in consumer habits prompted a second major change. In 1936, President Roosevelt ordered the U.S. Coast Guard into the icebreaking business. 
1936 executive order by President Roosevelt that stated that the Coast Guard should try to keep the navigable waters open during winter months basically caught the Coast Guard unprepared. Their turn of the century fleet would no longer suffice. The Coast Guard began an intensive study of icebreaker technology. Leading the research was Lieutenant Edward Thiel, who immediately turned to European designers for help. Because harsh Scandinavian winters would freeze harbors solid, countries such as Denmark and Sweden built some of the best icebreakers in the world. Thiel found that many of the European ships utilized bow propellers to clear the way in front of them, while powerful diesel electric engines battered the unrelenting ice. When he was over in Europe and looking at the icebreakers of the northern European countries, one of the things that Thiel realized was that some of the technology was already in use in the United States and other vessels. For example, the, the bow thrusters were being used on Great Lakes car ferries. What he was surprised is that nobody had put all of this technology together to create or to build an icebreaker. The culmination of Thiel's efforts was the 110-foot Raritan-class icebreaker tugs. Four of these vessels would be built in 1939. Their relatively short length allowed the ships to follow the winding leads and cracks in the ice but they still had plenty of power to punch through when necessary. But Thiel's greatest contribution to icebreakers would come as the world spiraled into war. With the outbreak of World War II, the icebreakers' reach would become global. A new breed of ship would become vital in the frozen North Atlantic. To remain for long periods of time in ice fields above the polar circle, these ships needed to be both phenomenally strong and large enough to carry the necessary supplies. The 269-foot wind-class icebreakers were contracted in November of 1941. Some of the world's first true polar icebreakers, the ships were strengthened by their close spacing of internal frames and carefully designed trusses. Combined with a 1 and 5 8 inch welded steel hull plating, these ships could resist 3,000 pounds of pressure per square inch along the waterline. At the beginning of the war, we based our designs on the uh, breakers that they had in Europe. They were much smaller icebreakers, and about 75% of them had a bow screw. We figured that the Europeans never left the fjords over there because as soon as we went into hard Arctic ice, we broke screws. And uh, consequently, uh, they were built that way, but we took them off within a couple of years. Once they were redesigned, the wind class breakers became the best the world had ever seen. So good that none fought for the U.S. The north wind, the south wind, and the west wind were loaned to the Russians for the duration of the war to help keep their ports open, which were very important for supplying the Russian war machine. But there were other fronts. With its best ice-breaking ship serving in Russian waters, the United States called on the breakers of the Bering Sea Patrol to help in the strategically important waters of the North Atlantic. These ships, as well as others, would form the Greenland Patrol. On patrol in the Arctic off Greenland, the United States Coast Guard cutter moves through bleak, iceberg-infested waters. She is one of four cutters on a two-month mission to smash German fortified radio bases on the remote Greenland coasts. One of the most important fronts during World War II for the United States was the Greenland Theater of Operations. Uh, many people don't realize how important that was. Greenland was being used by the Germans to predict the weather over the European theater. They were sending uh, weather teams there to uh, send out the weather reports. The other strategic need for Greenland was the cryolite mines. Uh, now, cryolite is a very important mineral that is used in the production of aluminum. Throughout the war, the ships and crews of the Greenland Patrol would attack and destroy German fortifications, thwarting their enemies' best efforts to acquire vital information and resources. At the end of the war, it seemed the ships, like the sailors who manned them, would return to the peacetime business of clearing shipping lanes. But that was not to be. Next, new global tensions leave the battle-tested American icebreakers in the coldest part of the Cold War. While the Soviet Union unleashes the power of the atom to build the strongest icebreakers the world has ever seen.
In December of 1946, Operation High Jump became the first post-war U.S. military mission to the South Pole. Commanded by Admiral Richard E. Byrd, 12 ships, including the U.S. Coast Guard's North Wind and the Navy icebreaker Burton Island, were to make way to Antarctica. The convoy's mission was to build the outpost Little America 4, near the Bay of Wales. Unfortunately, the 269-foot Burton Island, which was similar in design to the North Wind, was not built in time to join the convoy. This left the North Wind in charge of all ice-breaking duties and would have nearly disastrous consequences. At different times during the mission, all 11 vessels became trapped in ice. The first ship to become beset was the USS Mount Olympus. The North Wind made use of its towing rigs at the rear of the ship to pull the Navy frigate close and drag it from the clutching ice. Another ship in the convoy, the USS Yancey, had her three-quarter inch thick steel hull pierced by a wind-blown ice mass. She also had to be towed to safety. Equally unlucky, the submarine Senate was so severely damaged after colliding with the ice, she was forced to abandon the mission completely. The remaining ships pushed forward following the North Wind's lead as it opened the Bay of Wales to be used as a port and staging area. We first went to Antarctica, of course, in 1946, and then uh, that kind of slacked off until the early 50s, and they started what they called uh, Operation Deepfreeze. Every year since 1955, Operation Deepfreeze has sent a convoy of ships to the South Pole for base resupply and other military purposes. And every year, an icebreaker contingent has led the way. But the North Pole, due to its close proximity to the Soviet Union, would become far more strategically important. Fearing a Russian sneak attack, the United States built multiple distant early warning radar sites in northern Canada and Greenland. Known as the Dew Line, these sites would need constant resupply. Again, the icebreakers would lead the way. The Soviet Union also found the frozen polar waters extremely important. Mariners had long dreamed of opening northern shipping lanes like the Northwest Passage, connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean above Canada. For the Russians, the Great Northern Sea Route was the goal. In hopes of finding a way through the treacherous ice fields above northern Europe and Asia, Russian icebreakers were sent on missions in the early 1950s. Researchers and scientists would study atmospheric, water, and ice conditions. The information gathered would help them push icebreaker design to a new level. In 1959, the icebreaker Lenin was built. She would be the first surface vessel powered by nuclear reactors. On her first trial run in May of 1960, a contingent of shipbuilders and scientists were on hand to test everything from ice strength to radioactive hazards. The Lenin would become so successful in the waters off northern Siberia that she would be called on when other icebreakers were beset. The Soviet Union, with its abundance of untapped northern resources, would organize the greatest icebreaker missions the world has ever seen. Transportation of ore, oil, and countless other materials would continue year-round. To achieve this in the frozen northern waters, the Soviets would continue to build nuclear icebreakers through the 60s and 70s. They would become the fastest and strongest icebreakers of all time, able to force through eight feet of ice at 10 knots per hour. For the United States, the ships and missions would also begin to change. In the late 1960s, the Coast Guard took over several Navy icebreakers and we became the, the, the sole operators of U.S. polar icebreakers. The, the mission began to change as well, particularly in the Arctic, toward meeting the needs of science. But the aging wind-class icebreakers with their space-consuming deck guns 
were better suited for war than scientific exploration. In the late 1960s, partially due to the changing mission and partially due to superior Soviet ships, the U.S. began research on a new class of icebreaker, the Polar Class. The Polar Class, the Polar Sea and the Polar Star, which were uh, built in the uh, mid-70s, were a substantial uh, performance improvement over the wind class, predominantly because of the much larger size and a much greater horsepower. The Polar Class is able to run in two power ranges. The economically efficient diesel electric mode can produce a total of 18,000 horsepower. But if necessary, the captain can employ the gas turbines, able to create 75,000 horsepower. These engines are so forceful, they can only be used for short bursts. The 399-foot polar vessels became the most capable breakers in the U.S. fleet. By comparison, usually in McMurdo, based down in Antarctica, to break through the ice to take the supply ships in, you have uh, 150, maybe 300 miles of ice to break. The old wind class used to take them two to three weeks. The last I heard, the record was by the polar class was 17 hours. I mean, when they go to break, they break. Other advancements were also included in the polar ships. Their bows extend far out over the water. This transfers additional weight onto the ice. While at the back of the ship, the propellers were built so their pitch could be controlled. What the controllable pitch propellers allows you to do is to continually rotate the, the shaft in the same direction and yet change your thrust from a head thrust to an astern thrust by changing the pitch on the propeller blades. This advantage allows the ship to change direction without first stopping, then reversing the engines. But even the new ships had room for improvements. Having been designed as both science ships and military supply vessels, sacrifices have been made to accommodate both roles. The Coast Guard realized that the ships had some shortcomings with regard to laboratory space and over-the-side uh, equipment such as uh, oceanographic winches. So in the 80s, we designed a number of very significant ship alterations to the Polar class, which added uh, a much more robust scientific capability. The end of the Cold War saw an almost complete change in the U.S. icebreaker fleet. They were more than just ships that could break ice. They had become high-latitude research vessels. Russia would also see a change in their ships, but not for the better. The crumbling post-Cold War economy would offer little financial support for the once grand nuclear fleet. Today, a handful of the ships continue to operate, but many questions regarding safety and stability reverberate through the international maritime community. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's measuring, it's going up to a thousand there, that's very dangerous. Of primary concern, the radioactive hearts of these vessels, and storage of spent fuel, leaving some to believe the ships are nuclear disasters waiting to happen. Next, the quest for polar science advances as the U.S. Coast Guard unveils the newest icebreaker in its fleet. The newest member of the Coast Guard icebreaker fleet was commissioned in 1999. The U.S. Coast Guard cutter Healy is the largest non-nuclear icebreaker ever built. Constructed by Avondale Industries Incorporated in New Orleans, the 420-foot, 16,000-ton Healy boasts engines capable of producing 30,000 horsepower. Though less powerful than her peers in the Polar class, the Healy has been designed to do far more with fewer resources. Sophisticated computer control systems mean, if necessary, the entire ship can be sailed by as few as four people. Two on the bridge attending to navigation, and two in the engine control center, monitoring and maintaining the enormous power plant and drive systems. But a much larger crew is needed for polar missions. The Healy can accommodate 75 sailors, 
and 50 science specialists. From barbershop to onboard medical center, the Healy must provide for every need during the long months at sea. The Healy also houses some very special passengers. Two Dolphin H-65 helicopters can be hangered on the mid-deck and used for reconnaissance and transportation. In addition to the onboard equipment, the Healy has other attributes that make her remarkable. The Healy has a much more squared off hull form than the Polar class. Icebreakers in general have a reputation for rolling very badly in a seaway because of the football shape of the hull. Healy, on the other hand, has proven to be a very nice sea boat and rides very well in a seaway. The Healy is at home in the water, as was her namesake. Captain Michael Healy gained notoriety as the hard-working, hard-drinking captain of the U.S. revenue cutter Bear during the early years of the Bering Sea Patrol. Captain Healy was a very capable seaman, uh, very, very renowned for his, his knowledge of the ice and, and ice handling, but a very tough disciplinarian. Captain Healy's nickname was Hell Roaring Mike. He was uh, uh, certainly not a, a shy or shrinking person, but probably the most experienced revenue cutter captain. As if to proclaim her wild heritage, during her launching ceremony, the Healy dropped into the water and raised a 30-foot wave, which washed over spectators and dignitaries in the grandstand. Like the captain she was named after, she seemed a little too eager to leave the comforts of the warm southern waters and head for the frozen polar north. Her first encounter with ice was during an eight-month trial period in the waters between Canada and Greenland. The Healy's performance pleasantly surprised the captain and crew. During the ice trials, we wanted to test the ship, first of all, in level ice. And we did that in several thicknesses, and we found that while the design criteria specified that the ship must break at least four and a half feet of ice continuously at three knots, we found that we were able to break five and a half feet at just under three knots. So we felt that the ship really not only met the design criteria, but exceeded them as well. The level ice test was a resounding success. But it was important to see how well the new ship would handle the tough polar pressure ridges which most icebreaker crews do their best to avoid. Well, I think we broke a pressure ridge during the test that was, was approximately 28 feet high, but it was considerably thicker than that down below the waterline where you can't see it. The Healy's incredible strength is tempered by her sophisticated scientific capabilities. Well, Healy is very well suited for a wide range of science disciplines. We have lots of over-the-side capability where we can take samples from the ocean bottom. We can take samples from the water column. We also have a number of uh, electronic and acoustic systems. We have a bottom mapping sonar where we can actually map the topography of the ocean bottom. Uh, we also have things like a bow tower so we can do meteorological research, atmospheric research, pretty much uh, anything in biology, geology, oceanography. All of those things are, are capabilities of the vessel. In years past, captains used to look out at the ice in front of their ship and see a barrier that could not be crossed. Today, they see a door to discovery, to which the icebreaker is the key. The future of these magnificent ships will involve a complicated marriage between shipbuilders and polar scientists, making icebreakers not only the toughest ships on the water, but also some of the smartest.
Yokosuka Naval Base is home to some of the oldest dry docks in the world, much like the one right here behind me. And after 140 years, these 19th century French-style dry docks are still being used today by the U.S. Navy and Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force as they bring in a ship for regular scheduled maintenance. The obvious first step to getting a ship into the dry dock is flooding the dock. This is a relatively quick process, taking about an hour to get the water to the proper level. Once filled, it's time to remove the barrier called a caisson, then the real work begins. For today's evolution, we got a chance to dock one of the JMSDF ships SUMA. Uh, it is a big evolution, it takes all day. We have a very large qualified watch team that consists of U.S. Navy and our Japanese workforce. Everybody works together. Uh, everybody has to be on point and ready to react quickly to make sure that the ship stays safe. But before they can bring in the ship, Divers have to make a very crucial check. To make sure that the sill where the gate to the dry dock rests is free and clear of debris. That way it can actually form a proper seal and they can pump all the water out without more water rushing in. Now with the help of pusher boats, shipboard crew, and plenty of line handlers, it's time to move the ship into position. One of the most important and the most difficult parts of the evolution is the actual transit into the dock because everything happens very quickly. There's very little room for error, and there are many moving parts. With the ship in the dock and the caisson back in place, they now have to drain the water, which can be a bit of a waiting game. Luckily, we can speed ahead and join the divers again for one final check before clearing out all the water. We made sure that the middle of the keel was in line with the uh, front and last blocks in the row, and we just made sure that there was no hull appendages floating over the blocks that were going to get crushed when the ship sits on them. I want to credit the success of today's evolution to the teamwork and dedication of the U.S. Navy watch team and the Japanese workforce. Because of them, today's event was on time and safe. Japanese ship Suma is now ready for her maintenance period in Yokosuka's dry dock number two. Petty Officer Brian M. Brooks, Yokosuka Naval Base, Japan.